to cheese making today. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Nicole Sauce. I talk on his podcast from time to time and I forgot to introduce myself this morning. So when we, last year we were supposed to do a cheese demo and it didn't happen because I couldn't figure out how to heat the milk. And then I went home, made cheese and went, the stupid. I could, Jack had one. So, um, we were going to do farmer's cheese. The easiest cheese to get started with is farmer's cheese. The way I want to talk to you today is going to be a little bit more casual than some of the other um, sessions. If you have a question as we go, ask it. Except for Jake. Except for Jake. <laughs> I don't have any questions. Okay. <laughs> Except for Jake. Only, only answers. <laughs> <laughs> so the cool thing about cheese is it's so easy to make. The less cool thing about cheese is it is more expensive to make than to buy in a lot of cases. Unless you're doing something like raising your own cow, your biggest expense is going to be the milk. I pay $14 a gallon for goat milk at home that's raw. And and it, it's, it starts with the milk, right? And if you think, as Jack just said right before we started this, if you think about all of the rules, like I was trying to get up to 86 degrees, and I want to be at exactly 86 degrees, you can get very scientific with this. If you love being scientific, cheese is fun. If you love just sort of winging it, cheese is also fun. It's really hard to ruin cheese. At the end of the day, if you don't get the cheese you were going for, you know what you still have? Cheese. 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 So, um, we're going to cover today basic equipment, the process. I'm going to demo how you make feta. The feta will not be finished today because it takes a few days to cure and to drain, but feta takes you through all the steps you basically need to know up until you're making a hard cheese like a Parmesan. Then um, I'll walk you through the process of making the farmer's cheese just because I know you can go home and do that with what you have. So let's start with equipment. Um, I have more equipment here than I need to make cheese with. Okay, so if all you have is one of these, who has one of these? Who does not have one of these? Okay. Do you have that one? Because you need yeah, that. that. Yeah, this is a great one. Um, so a strainer is really helpful. You can get away without it, but I like to have it. Okay, who has one of these? If you can stir your food, great. If you don't have one of these, I highly recommend buying a spoon if you're going to cook at home. Um, measuring cups are really helpful. When I got here, I assumed that the Spirico household would have measuring cups, and Dorothy went out and bought these. <laughs> I don't measure. You don't measure. I use my eyes. If you don't have these, you can still figure it out by, you know, a teaspoon, and you take a spoon out of your drawer, and you need about a quarter of that. The measurements don't have to be that precise, but having measuring cups is a great idea. This thing is super helpful for me, and I usually travel with two of them, but I didn't know how TSA was going to feel about the pokey thing in my bag, so <laughs> it's an instant read thermometer. If, you're, if you really get into cheese and you're doing some of the thermometer testing, you want to... Um, you want to have a second one in case it breaks. Two is one, one is none. Before I knew Jack, I knew two is one, one is none because of cheese making. And then something of this shape that could be a knife. It could be a frosting spreader. You can actually spend a whole bunch of money on buying a curd cutting knife. Why would you do that? You'll have this one thing in your kitchen that's dedicated to one thing. So I find these bread knives, if you have one, are really helpful. He had one in his drawer. This is your knife. So I this is... This is a knife, you want to have that. And then you want to have rennet, which is a coagulant. And I'm shaking it around because if we don't put the coagulant in soon, at the end of this thing, we will not have curd. So rennet, basically I am curdling the milk, putting the rennet in to make the curdled milk talk to each other. And if you need to demo with um, water in the future, just know that these wonderful hollow roast mugs that are for sale in the back, are perfect for transporting water. So when you use your rennet, you don't just go straight into cheese because then it'll start grabbing onto things. You want to dilute it a little bit. So I use for a feta cheese, and I'll go back through this when we go through step by step. I use um, about a quarter to half a teaspoon for three gallons. We're doing 1.75 gallons because the cheese bandit got in there. So then you, just, you start stirring it a little bit and dribble it over. It's diluted, it gets mixed in. And the reason I'm doing this now is so you can see what a clean cut looks like in about 45 minutes. 
So who wants to set a timer for me? Give me 30. We'll check it in 30. Okay, so back to equipment. There are also things that make cheese happen. Farmer's cheese. Has, have you ever coagulated milk? How do you do that? Leave it in the fridge. Leave it in the fridge too long? We're Why sour. does it coagulate when you do that? It goes sour. What does sour mean? Yeah, it means it's got acid. It right? means its pH got acidic, which yeah. means it went, it dropped. Put lemon juice. Lemon oil. If you add lemon juice to oil, it'll make it coagulate, which means the solids separate from the liquids, right? Vinegar. Anybody else use something like citric acid? This you can buy in the canning section, and it is used to um, drop the acid or the uh, pH, so increase the acidity if you're canning, for example. You can do that. Um, so we have citric acid as something that's easy to come by. If you don't have this though, you can get around it by using any other acidic thing like lemon juice or vinegar, which goes back to a lot of times making cheese can be done with whatever's in your house. Um, when you're doing a cultured cheese, which is what feta is, that means that we are fermenting the milk. We like fermentation, right? You put a culture in the milk it eats all the little yummy things and it poops out acidic stuff and it coagulates the milk, okay? And it adds flavor. Another thing we can add is lipase. Who was on the group and saw me looking for lipase? There was a drama about lipase this year. Apparently as part of the shortages, when you order lipase, it takes two months to get this little packet of goodness. This will add, you can choose different flavors. So this one is a sharp lipase that's made from cow right? You can get it from goat. You can get a whole bunch of different flavors. So that's basic cheese making equipment for soft cheeses. There's one more thing if you're going to go hard cheeses, which is the cheese press. Do you know where yours is? No. no. Okay. A cheese press, basically you make your cheese and it's a soft cheese. You put it in a strainer that's round, usually put a weight on it. It squeezes more of the liquid out, makes it harder. I was joking earlier, I made a cheddar cheese just right after my workshop in April, put it in the cheese press, forgot it was there. Oh, oh, Overpressed the cheese. Did I ruin the cheese? No. Like super hard. Do you know what I had? I had a Parmesan style cheese that had started as a cheddar. That was all it was. It, you know, a Parmesan uses a different um, microbe for the that fermentation piece, but it was okay. So, questions about any of the things. Did you have a workshop in April when that done? Huh? Did you have a workshop yeah, in April? Yeah, I done? moved it. Never mind. <laughs> Let's just pretend April didn't even exist, right? Um, okay. And then this equipment here is for demo purposes. So if you're making cheese and you don't have a sous vide and two perfectly sized containers like the Spirico household does, you can use a pot that'll fit in your sink, which the, you can get a smaller pot than this, and your sink with water. And you don't have to have the sous vide, which I've just messed up. <laughs> okay. You can just put hot water in there and use it like a double boiler. That trick for cheese making for me, like, made the whole thing easier. Because when I first started learning to make cheese, they were like, make your frying pan into a double boiler. And I was always burning the milk and it would scald to the bottom. Put your pot of milk in the sink with hot water from your tap. Done. If it gets up to temperature, pull it back out. If it starts dropping, put it back in, right? So that's that's the, uh, the, the secret we get today. So um, some other equipment that you will run across that I don't have here. If you're making a hard cheese like a cheddar, which ages, you coat it in wax so that nasty bacteria from outside doesn't get in and start growing molds. If you grow mold on the outside of your cheese, though, what do you do? Cut it off. You can cut it off. You can wipe the cheese down with vinegar. That's that's a, a trick from my buddy Cheese Man in South Africa. Oh, I mold it again. Rubs it off with vinegar. Um, and then the last thing we have is, this is really helpful for farmer's cheese, right? The $20 cheese straining cloth. Now, um, a tool case with a 100 count 100% cotton, 100 count thread count. 
and a pair of scissors makes you a cheesecloth that strains really well. Don't don't buy special cheesecloths unless you have a reason to. Just oh, you can get them for like two bucks at Walmart. So cheesecloth, and that's it. So the process: the first thing you do when you're making cheese is you find a good source of milk, right? Um, I prefer to use raw milks, and if I need it pasteurized for this, the cheese, I'll pasteurize it myself. Um, today we're using store-bought milk, and it is pasteurized already, which means I don't know if we're going to get curd. That's not tense at all in front of a whole bunch of people, by the way. Um, Ultra-pasteurized milk, those are the milks you find in the store that it's October 1st, and it um, expires sometime in December. Um, and there's two different processes happening there. So pasteurized milk, 180 degrees for five minutes pasteurizes milk. And it kills the bad bacteria that could be like listeria or something. Uh, ultra pasteurized, they take it higher for a shorter period of time and cool it really quickly. And something in that process makes it so you don't always form a curd. So if you're gonna buy milk at the store, look for pasteurized, it can be hard to find. Like his. Dorothy has bought me milk two years in a row, and every time she's like, is it this one? Is it that one? Because yeah. most of the milk you're going to find is ultra-pasteurized, and most of the organic milk you find is ultra-pasteurized because that business model works, because of the long shelf life, it works better to be able to ship that further with ultra-pasteurized. Yeah. Are they, clear, are they clearly labeled? I feel like I've tried to find this, look for this before, and I can't even tell. That's why I'm a little scared about this, because it said pasteurized. Its expiration date was 11-22, which is in the realm of how long pasteurized milk could last before it goes bad. If it had been December, I would have known. No, right? But it's not always clearly labeled. Jake? If you use a raw milk, do you use the whole gallon with all the fat, or do you shake it up? How do you just... So to make feta cheese specifically, I will use whole milk. Okay. Yeah, this is um, a recipe for three gallons. I'm doing you know 1.75 gallons of whole milk. This is cow's milk. I usually use goat's milk, and I usually use raw. And to start it, I what I did while you were out doing your property walk is I took the milk, I started the double boiler, and I got it heated up. If you're using um, the pasteurized milk, you add calcium chloride. And that helps facilitate the separation of the solids and the liquids, because this has been homogenized too, right? Which means it's, been, it's it, it, homogenous. The fat's not gonna separate from the solids as it would with your raw milk. With raw milk, you take it home, it hasn't been you know, shaken up. I think they should just shake it up really hard. Yeah. And then it, it, it locks the liquid and the fats together that are in milk, and they don't come apart. Well, I want them to come apart, right? So the calcium chloride, for every gallon of milk, you're gonna add a quarter teaspoon of calcium chloride. You're gonna put it in a quarter cup of water, stir it up so it's nice and diluted, and then pour it in the same way that I did the rennet, okay? So this stuff, you know where you find it? Canning aisle, it helps make your pickles crispier. And one of these lasts me for ever, ever. yeah. Also, the TSA was really interested in this stuff when I came through. <laughs> the lady, like, she opens it up and goes, Ugh. and then she went, you know what that's supposed to look like? And the lady's like, no. She's like, well, it's powder. Gave it back to me. <laughs> I could have had anything in there. It didn't look like cocaine. Well enough, so. So. Okay, so, yeah. Does it matter on your rent if liquid tabs, animal, vegetable, do you care? Um, I prefer liquid because I have better success with liquid than tabs. The tabs, you just need to dissolve them, right? So not really. I, I prefer um, between animal and not animal. My little lid's missing. Um, like, because they have the vegetarian rennet versus, like, it's, a, it's an enzyme in the stomach. So you can think, like, how did we figure out cheese? Somebody needed to carry their milk with them in the stomach. I don't know. Um, that would do it though. You'd end up with cheese on the other side and you're not gonna, you're not gonna waste that. Um, it doesn't, I like the double strength. So here's what I prefer. Liquid double strength rennet. It's a vegetable rennet. I will use animal rennet because I'm not a vegan. And I don't know why a vegan would be making rennet and putting it in milk because that's not vegan. But people get all PC about this stuff. It's weird. Because um, it's mean to kill cats. Because it's, yeah, well. That's why. Is it? That's what they say. Okay. Uh, yeah. And then the tabs, like sometimes you will order your your 
uh, mesophilic culture or your thermophilic culture will come with the tabs and then I'll just use it to use it up, right? Um, all right, this is the standard size that Reddit comes in on Amazon and you can buy this for 10 to $15. This will make about, it's gonna make about 10 batches of cheese or so, okay? You can buy a quart of this for $30. So I buy a quart of it, keep it in my fridge and refill this because it's much easier to pour out of this little bottle. But because I'm making, if, if you're only making cheese once in a while, you just get the $10 bottle, right? But if you're gonna make it a lot, it's better to buy in bulk. It's the same with the lipase and the other things. Okay, so back to the cheese. So you start, you get it up to temperature. If you're doing a cheese like a feta, you're gonna use a culture. The culture is called a mesophilic culture. It's used for things like yogurt and feta and cheddar. He's making, Nick's making faces. Um, there's another kind of culture. It's called thermophilic culture. What's the difference? Temperature, oddly enough. So mesophilic culture, you end up, it, it, go, it basically will do its work up to 90 degrees. If you get over 90 degrees, it, it becomes unhappy and goes, which is why I was running with ice in here because I started getting up above, towards 90 degrees and I didn't want to kill anything. Thermophilic culture above 90 degrees will do its work of eating the fats and the sugars in here and or the sugars in here and pooping out acid, okay? So you get it up to 86 degrees. That took me 45 minutes today. In my kitchen sink, it takes me 15 from fridge to 85 degrees. I set the sous vide at 90 degrees when I'm doing that. So I set it a little higher and then I drop it down once we reach the 80, you know, you're going for 83 to 87 range. It doesn't have to be exactly 86 degrees. Scientific people out there, I can see you like. You don't want to obsess over that. It's not worth it. It's still gonna do its job. Yeah. But if you take it from refrigerator and use it a Nova sous vide and do it that way. Is is doing it over a longer period of time detrimental? Or do you need to bring it up faster? Does it go bad? I don't know. I guess not. I mean, it's not going to go bad in 45 minutes, okay. right? Unless something was bad in there to begin with. So, okay. Um, so you set it, forget it. Yeah, and if you've introduced a, a nasty bacteria, then that's, you know, because you want to make sure these are sterile before you start. Two ways to sterilize or to use a chemical or to boil it. I usually use metal. Uh, utensils because I can boil them and you boil them and then I put my little towel out and and the, the truth of the matter is if you get a random errant thing it's usually not something that ruins your cheese but That's the one crazy. time the one time it does ruin your cheese you're gonna be really sad because you put all of this work in it's kind of like canning you know if you didn't sterilize the jar right and it molds and it explodes and takes out another couple jars you just wasted a whole day and you're lucky you didn't feed that to your family cool thing about that um, okay so you start the milk it's heating you've added the culture you've added the calcium chloride and that's what I did while you were out there and then you walk away for an hour what this means in my house is I dedicated cheese day and cheese day starts you know either at about 2 in the afternoon or about 10 in the morning so we're not running into a meal and thou shalt not use my sink for an hour for a two hour period of time for feta because I'm gonna keep doing things in the sink because what I really don't want is somebody washing their hands or doing their dishes and splashing over, okay? So you walk away for an hour, you let it do its work, then you come back. If you don't have a sous vide keeping at the right temperature, you'll wanna check in once or twice during that hour to make sure it's staying above 80-ish degrees so that you know that that culture is happily eating, it's in, a, it's in a pleasant mood, you wanna have a pleasant cheese, and it will ferment it for you. And then you add the rennet like you saw me do. Again, you're gonna dilute that in some water, put the quarter teaspoon of rennet in, stir it while you're dumping, and then you stir it really well for about 15 seconds, go the other way. The reason you're doing that is you want it really uniformly blended in there. What you don't wanna do is take a stick blender and go, because that will stress out the milk and you may end up with a weird curd later. If, you, if you're a little too violent with the milk, I've found that my curd gets unhappy with me. It doesn't, it doesn't cohesively form, it's a little runny. So, and all these processes are all the same for the nasty uh, ricotta or whatever it is? Ricotta is a totally different cheese. Okay, what was it? Uh, this is 
Feta. The nasty feta and then all the other good ones. All the other good feta, feta no, cheeses? All the other good cheeses. So this, feta this, is the same process, right? this process will stand for any cheese that is based on a curd. So we're going to make a curd. So like a cheddar cheese up until this point, you're basically with a few different, <laughs> you, you might use a different lipase in there, right? And you can use a thermophilic culture on a cheddar, I believe. Do you go thermophilic? You bake cheese, right? Yeah. 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 Mozzarella. Um, same for um, Parmesan, which is another pressed cheese. Okay. So then you put it in, and we're going to wait 30 to 45 minutes while the coagulated, because what happened in that hour is it coagulated, which meant the fat separated from the solids. This is really a bummer when you're like making a pudding or something and you accidentally do it, right? And then it's like, blip, 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 blip. No, that's not very good pudding. Um, here we want that, but there are a bunch of little tiny little specks of fat in liquid. What this is doing is making them feel the love of the rennet and start holding hands and forming a big block. You don't stir during this time, because if you do, you will mess up your curd. And we want it to become a big solid hunk separate from the liquid that we will then continue to press the whey out of. So then you end up with curds and whey. We all know the little Miss Muffet thing, right? That's basically what that is, is it's, it's the rennet has unified them, okay? Um, and then in some cheeses, like cheddar, what I will do with this cheese is we'll cut it, cut the curd, I'll show you how to cut the curd because there's a way to make the curd happen that works with a knife. Um, and then it will, uh, we, we cook it a little, I leave it without adding heat so that more liquid drains out so the curd becomes more solid so that when I strain it, I can press it into a block that we will then cure as feta cheese, salt, and then brine. And eventually, about two weeks later, it's like this. It's a bunch of yummy feta. I can tell Nick loves feta. Yummy. He's over there going, which we are going to have out about the time you guys get peckish at five or so. I'll put some of this out so you can taste it. And from there, if it were a cheddar, you would actually raise the temperature up, which is the cheddaring of the cheese. And then you press that in the cheese, cheese press. I mean, it's, it's literally the same path until you're like, well, now I'm doing a cheddar that I'll make into a Parmesan. And that's it. What? Could you technically cut that in half and make feta out of one half and keep on going with cheddar on the other? Save some time. It wouldn't be worth it. It's it's not that. You'll see how much curd we get oh, out of it. Not yeah. A lot. Okay, gotcha. Oh, uh, Dowie, what do you got? I was just counting Jake's question. Oh, do you, got, do you have the airsoft gun with you? You might need to get it and get up here. Now we have a real one. John Dowie has, has, has made it to the property. He's going to get an airsoft gun, too. So, the reason I got into making cheese is I love raw milk in my coffee. I also love raw heavy cream in my coffee. And I have a goat share. And I get a gallon of milk a week. And I go through that much in my coffee in a week. So, I would have three quarters of a gallon left. I would throw it into the freezer until I had enough to do a batch of cheese, and then I do a batch of cheese. And so it's been kind of folding into the cheese as we serve. Nighthawk can attest, I love putting it out so he can enjoy his cheese. Yeah. yeah. Pull your hair away from the, I think you're at least. Oh, I guess it's a speaker. Okay, I'm popping. <laughs> Is it popping? It's this one. Okay. It's just, it's, it's Hatch's favorite speaker is popping. Um, and so that's, that is feta. I will show you that when the alarm goes off. We'll show you the cutting of the curd and to see if it's a clean break. Another kind of cheese you can make, which was brought up, was ricotta. You asked how is ricotta different, right? Did you have a question? No. Ricotta or ricotta. Basically, what you're doing there is you're coagulating the milk and you strain it out. So I will add citric acid to the milk and or vinegar or lemon juice, heat it up until it's just before boiling, which means there's bubbles at the edge of the pot. And then pour it through, you know, I let it sit for about 15 minutes. And you can tell when you stir it, if it's coagulated, pour it through a strained cloth and that is fed. You can add salt or other flavorings. Um, 
when we strain the whey out of this, if we were going to be super efficient with the use of our milk, we would add the whey to the to another gallon of milk and get any of the rest of the solids that are left in this to make a ricotta cheese. Okay. Questions? Yeah. Mozzarella. Who if wants to hear about the, that? Well, if you made the ricotta. How much of it, you say you have some left over, you make that in the ricotta. How much is left over, do you think? How many fats are left in the milk after making a feta? Well, the volume of it. Still, still I don't running. understand your question. Okay. Sean, get that airsoft gun. <laughs> <laughs> on the shelf. You get it. So from this batch of milk, there'll be about that much fat left that would turn into ricotta cheese. So when I use whey for ricotta, which you don't have to do, I will take a gallon of whole milk and I'll add that to it. And then I'll lemon it when it's okay. cold, bring the temperature up and then and then go from there. You can add heavy whipping cream, I'll do that too. If I just have heavy whipping cream in the fridge, I'll just dump it in there. Okay. It's all, and, and then you can store, so storing, um, the feta cheese, you're gonna brine after you, so where we'll get today is that we've cut the curd we're straining the curd. Tomorrow, what I'm going to do without being on the, the agenda, but if you're interested in seeing it, is I'll cut it into hunks like this and salt it. And then you, you leave it in a covered container to continue. It's conti those little bacteria are in there still eating, right? They're, it's changing the flavor and more whey will drain out over a three day period of time. Once it's been out for three days, flipping every day, pouring the whey off, you put it in a brine, which is one half cup of salt to get per gallon of water. That so you heat on the stove, you make it, you let it cool down, and then you put the cheese in and pour that over it. Once it's in the salt water, this will last in my fridge for six months. It's not a problem. So you don't need to freeze it. You just I have these jars sitting in my fridge with We feta. ate it for about four months when you left us on. Yeah, I left some last year. You probably need get more this year. And then if you, what I do is I'll take one of these hunks out and just put it in a, in a Tupperware that we're eating off of until I take the next one out. For ricotta cheese, if I want to store it, I freeze it and then just defrost it. I mean, I'm just going to use it in a lasagna anyway, probably. Yeah. I was making like cottage cheese. Different. So cottage cheese is curds and whey. Yeah. So when you get this and you cut the curd and you drain the whey out and then you heat it, like you would, ch I would cheddar it. Do you cheddar yours? No. Yeah, that's it. You just, the more they're allowed to get solidified in the, in the way, which means you've heated them some, which is why I cheddar them, then that's curds and whey. Cottage cheese. Yeah, so good. Add salt. I, I add salt mm -hmm. to everything. Yeah. How long does the brine last? Like you said, you get a quart, like, until the end of time. No, it lasts a really long time as long as you keep it cold. So I have a, like this one, I I don't know if after traveling around and sitting around at room temperature, it's so good for me to continue using this when I get home, but I keep the quart bottle in the fridge. I keep, what I have is a Tupperware. This was my biggest innovation. How many of you lose things in your fridge? You know, this little packet in my fridge is gonna end up in the back corner bottom cheese drawer and I'll never see it again. So I have a Tupperware for all cheese things and I put this in, I put my rennet in, I put my mesophilic culture, which I brought in a baggie, which did also did not get taken by the TSA. I was surprised about that. And I'll, I will put citric acid and I will put the calcium chloride, even though they need, don't need to go in the fridge, all in a Tupperware in the fridge so that it's not, uh, so that things don't age, but so it's all, it's like my little kit. And that has made it so when I make cheese, all I have to do is find the thermometer and get going. And it, it, you know, when I was keeping some things in the fridge and some things in the cabinet, it was, it was not good for me. So, yeah. And then the thermophilic culture, I usually leave in the freezer because I hardly ever use thermophilic culture. Yeah. Okay, farmer's cheese. By the way, there's a recipe on the, uh, that'll be available, I think. Do you want it on the video or not? You can. Yeah, let me shoot it real quick. It's up to you. Doesn't matter. They can yeah. look it up. You can look it up. Go to sous vide everything and look it up there. Sous vide everything, look it up. Sous vide yes. cheese. So farmer's cheese, which we're not demoing, would just be a gallon of milk, 
juice of one lemon or a half cup of vinegar, heat it up and strain it. And then the cool thing about, what did you say? You press your term, farmer's cheese. I press it. It doesn't ever get like a hard cheese at no. all. But no. you get a lot better holding of the shape mm -hmm. and like a better cheese. And I heat it up to whatever the temperature that crazy freaking Peruvian dude said to do it. Yeah. And then you dump the milk, the vinegar in and it curdles instantly. You strain it through like like that. Yeah. Dump it in the press and I put it in the refrigerator and I put something under it to catch the yeah. cheese goop. And I take like a 25 pound barbell plate and set it on top of it. Mm -hmm. And it about two or three days, you can eat it right away, but like two or three days, it's in pretty good shape. Yeah. If you use more than 25 pounds, it like oozes out of the little holes in the thing, so don't do that. Mm -hmm. 25 pounds it shall be and not more. When you press cheddar, it's in the cloth in the thing. Yeah. So it doesn't squish out the sides. I don't know, maybe I should have done it that way. I don't Try know. Try it that way. You might be able to press it more. What's his name didn't say to do? What's his name, Jake, the CB editing guy? Guga, yeah, Guga didn't say to do that. Yeah, so, so you can improve on his uh -huh. on his recipe by trying that. Why well, Guga was wrong about sous vide cheese? Video well, and the my thing is, go do out tomorrow. <laughs> if you're gonna do a farmer's cheese and press it, I would add a little bit of salt and maybe. Oh yeah, salt. salt, a little bit jalapenos. of salt and and a flavor. Chopped jalapenos Rosemary's and garlic. Rosemary's really good too. Jalapeno and garlic. Garlic, yeah. Um, mozzarella cheese is a little bit different of an animal, and and all of these cheeses, if you're getting into cheeses, make. Learn how to make a chev, learn how to make a farmer's cheese, learn how to make a, uh, a ricotta cheese, then go and do your feta, and then do a mozzarella. Because it, it's like everyone adds another step. That's yeah, I always start with farmer's cheese and then we go up from there. Yeah. You could, you could do like a yogurt cheese. Yeah. Like, like to start off with. That's like, as far as I know, the simplest. Yeah, if you make yogurt and then strain it through a cloth, it becomes like a cream cheese consistency, and you've just made a yogurt cheese. I think you did that. Yeah. Didn't you do that? Yeah. 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 Garlic, yeah. garlic and jalapenos. Are we at half an hour yet? <laughs> you chop them. You chop them. I'm at 27. Okay. Don't have to. Sorry. Okay, I'm not going to hate my life later. I'm so glad. Yeah. It's not a clean break yet, but. <laughs> it's breaking. Yeah. Also fries really well. Have okay. you ever done that? I have not fried it. It's the same as like Indian yeah. beer cheese, if you've ever had that dish. Yeah. So you can cube it and fry it in a white oil like coconut oil. Oh man, that, that is so good. good. That does sound good. It might be grilled food, Because it doesn't melt. Right. Yeah. It's not a melting cheese, right. so. Awesome. Yeah. 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 I'm literally having stuff on Amazon if you're talking about it. Oh. Uh, you said the mesophilic culture. Mesophilic. I mean, so. Do you need thermal? Like? You don't. If you're going to start with all the cheeses I just listed, you do not need a thermophilic. And if you're going to do a mozzarella, it's a mesophilic. So it's just all the one. Uh, yeah, so there's some places where you can get things. Cheesemaking.com. I've been able to get things in bulk. And they're usually really efficient, except for this time with the life haste. <laughs> Amazon's great for getting it quickly, but it's usually smaller amounts. I think it's the, uh, yeah, I don't know why I'm up there. T-Spaz. T-Spaz, <laughs> go to T-Spaz, absolutely, because Amazon kicked me off as an affiliate, so give him the money. <laughs> you might as well, right? What'd you do? Why did they boot you? I don't know. I never, I asked them why, I appealed it, and they said because we said, and I decided I wasn't up for that fight. Instead, I just I nickel and dime them for five dollars. Is every time something's late on Prime, that's my new strategy. <laughs> or when they don't mail me my drill, <laughs> just is what it is. Okay, so do you want to hear about mozzarella or not? Because yeah. I've thrown a lot. Okay, mozzarella follows the same trajectory as the feta, and we get to the point where we cut the curd, which is coming in a few minutes, and you strain it out. You strain out the whey from the curd, and then you're basically going to heat up that curd and stretch it so it becomes the consistency of mozzarella. I like to think, uh, basically, it's like, you know when you melt cheese and then it solidifies again, like a cheddar cheese on a hamburger or something? You're basically doing that to the, to the curd to turn it into mozzarella. You add a little bit of salt, and you're pressing the whey out. There are two ways to stretch it. One is to take a pot and boil it, and you'll have this ball of curd 
when you've pressed it out and you put it in and you have a, you'll have a slotted spoon with more slots than this. They make that, you know that big Asian frying thing that has like, it's more like a, a grate than a, than a slotted spoon. Yeah, that works really well. You put it in and you bring it back out, heating it up and then you stretch it and then you put it in. And if you're, you can't do it with your fingers as it gets hotter, so you'll use two, two spoons. We just had a time, time those. And as you're doing this, way, more whey is coming out of it to make it a little bit more solid. And when it's about the right, it, it, gets, it goes from being sort of dull colored curds to shiny. That's when you shape it and then you cool it quickly in like an ice water bath in your sink. And then you can, you can store it in a brine or if you just store it without the brine, you can use it up within about a week. That's, that's one way. I'm lazy. I don't like to work that hard. What I prefer to do is to take my mozzarella and salt it, the curd, before I've started stretching it and heating it in a glass dish and go to the microwave, put it in the microwave and heat it for 30 seconds. And then I use two spoons to, to press and pour off the whey. And then I put it back in the microwave four to five times. That will allow me to work that cheese enough that it's, it, it's a very good mozzarella and I didn't have to boil all that water and put all that heat into my house. So that's, that's like the hack that a lot of cheesemakers do because when you're doing a demo, it's really cool to show the stretching and the boiling water and how hard that is. Why make it hard? That's not my philosophy. And it will store, you can, same thing. You can make a brine. If you want to store it in a brine, it'll store longer in your fridge. You'll store it a month or two that way, as long as you're keeping the, keeping it cold, keeping the bacteria out. And mozzarella is another one you can freeze, but it's not as good once it, once it defrosts. So, okay. So if you want to see what a clean break looks like, we probably don't have quite. Okay. So come on up if you're interested in seeing this. Um, the way to test for a clean break is you slice down the curd and then you want to see, does it hold its shape? So I'm slicing now with the knife and you can just see how it pulls out and you can see an edge there. That's not really a clean break. It's close, but you can see how that, and the liquid comes out. That's a clean break. Um, in my world, I'm gonna let this go another 15 minutes before we we actually cut the curd, because you can see that it's, it's it's got some of this soft stuff coming off here. But if you don't get a clean break at this point or don't start to see that that's happening, you may have messed up your cheese. Do you know what you do if you messed up your curd? Oh, it's farmer's cheese. I don't know how to rescue a curd once you, I mean, you give it more time to see if it, if that will, if it will bind together, right? But if it doesn't, what you have, you can still see, if you look at the consistency, this is almost like yogurt right now, right? You can run that through that same cloth and it's still gonna taste good. It just won't be what you were going for and that's, I think that's the thing a lot of people forget when they're cooking. They're like, oh no, I messed it up. I've ruined it and they throw it out. And you're like, well, you just made farmer's cheese. You just made a cultured farmer's cheese instead of using a lemon or vinegar to do it. But basically you have the same thing. You've separated the fats from the, from the liquids in the milk, press it out, eat it. It's still good, right? So um, cutting the curd, your goal here is about two inch squares. And this is going into this. So just 90 degrees to the surface, you cut it. I usually go about an inch apart because I'm weird. Other people are really precise, as you can tell I'm not. This is not a clean enough break for me to be super happy, but then you go the other way, right? They make for a square container, a knife you can put down there that has a grid that you do that with. It's expensive though. So what I do is I go 45 along those same lines and just go through like that. The thing about cutting your curd into two inch squares is if they are not square, the cheese does not care. The cheese is okay. The purpose of having two inch squares is to give it enough surface area that the whey continues to drain. And then you do it the other way. I'm usually doing this in a round container, which is super fun. Prefer square though? Huh? Prefer square? Um, right now I don't prefer a square because it's new. 
Oh. And new things are scary. Then I go 45. So I'll go diagonal and in. And so some of these are not two inch square. Some of these end up a little messy. This works better in a circle. And we'll go that way. So you can see why like a long thin knife is much better than my chef knife, for example, is not the right shape for this. Plus Patrick would be sad because I'd probably ding it up and then make him have to fix it. Right, Patrick, are you even here? Not here. So what you end up with, what you end up with are chunks, which you can kind of, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna sin against cheese here. You end up with chunks like this. For feta cheese, at this point, you walk away again for about 10 or 15 minutes. What's happening now is we have sliced through the curd and whey is continuing to drain out through all of those. You're keeping it at about 86 degrees. So it's kind of cooking it to kind of keep the, the whey coming out. And then we're gonna pour it through this strainer. Um, and that's why I have the giant pots because I was pretty sure Jack didn't want a bunch of whey on his floor. And I don't see a sink around anywhere. So we'll pour that through. You need a 15 minute count. Um, it'll be right about when we're done with the session. So in 15 minutes, can somebody give me a 15 minute count? Again, give me 10 actually. We'll pour it through this and strain it out. And then we tie the cheese. I'm gonna show you tying the cheese. Without, you just tie it one corner over like this. Just pretend there's cheese in there because you know, time. And then the other way, like this. This is kind of important. And what will happen is the cheese is up in there and there are no gaps. This means if you have flies in your house, they can't get to the cheese. So, and then I'll hang it by tying another knot here and it just drains out the bottom through this cloth. But I start in the strainer because there's a lot of liquid that needs to go out first. And if you don't, if you just try to go in the cloth, it's floppy and half your curd goes into your sink. Ask me how I know. <laughs> Right? right? The way we get good yeah, at cooking right. is by messing things yeah. up. So that's cheese. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Okay. Things you can do with the whey. One, you can save the whey and then turn it into a ricotta cheese, right? By adding additional milk to it. Other things I use the whey for, we have a really bad tomato blight problem in Tennessee. And many of us in sort of the Southeastern United States know what I'm talking about. Um, I will mix a cup of whey to a gallon of water and add in Dawn dish soap and C40 minerals and use that as a foliar spray. And it kind of helps. It slows down the, the blight a bit. Um, you can feed it to your animals if you're not gonna use it. You can use it instead of water in baking your loaf of bread if you're a bread baker. Um, you can just use it to fertilize. It's If you put it on the ground around your plants, it's fine. You don't wanna dump all the whey on the same plant all the time, right? But I mean, those are the ways that I use whey. Anybody ways else use them for anything? Whey, yeah. Ways to use whey. Anybody else use it? Else, do you have whey? We feed it to our animals. Yeah, they do. The pigs really will dig it. The chickens will go nuts over it, so. You could put it in a smoothie or a shake, yeah. I mean, it's it's still got milk fats in it. It's got, you know, the same bacteria that, it's got that same culture. And the way it's very potent, is what people are trying to mm -hmm. put in their smoothies a lot anyway. Mm -hmm. So have you ever made that have carb, sour cream or buttermilk? Or the I mean, the carbs are in the milk. Well, a little bit. <laughs> I'm sure it has carbs. I don't know how many carbs whey you know, has, but I'm sure it does. The curd or the whey. Are the carbs in the curd or the whey? That's usually well, what cheese is generally keto friendly yeah. yeah, usually. Uh, it's, it is eating the sugars to poop it out, but it doesn't get rid of them all. It doesn't get rid of all of it. Yeah. 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 Any remainder is probably in the whey. Yeah. Say. Probably. I, I'd have to look that up. I think, I think the fat and the whatever carbs are left are in the cheese, and the, the whey is mostly protein. Protein. Okay. Well, that I did not know. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. But cheese is kind of keto friendly right but so it has carbs like, what little yeah. so it can't have a lot of carbs bit, yeah i would suspect the majority were eaten by the bacteria yeah like a a one at like a one inch cube of cheese i think has half or <coughs> one carb it's about that much 
Well, I wonder if it was led because, you know, milk has the most carbs, half and half, less, heavy cream, less, mm -hmm. cheese, less. So that was like sort of that. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, but in, in order to, so to that, culture it, it or ferment it, they're eating the so sugars, right? Process, there's, there's to digest them. It, so maybe it sticks in the way. Yeah. You make sour cream or... Sour butter cream. Or butter milk. The easiest way to make sour cream is to get heavy whipping cream, because I like it. <laughs> I like it as much bad as I can get. Um, take sour cream from the store that has a live culture. Take, you know, quarter cup of that, throw it in there, shake like hell and leave it at room temperature if your room temperature is in the 70s overnight. I mean, you can heat it and hold it at heat, but that, I just leave it in a mason jar that's not screwed all the way that's down that's because guess that's what, that's boom, so right? No. With a cloth over it, maybe. You could yeah. do cloth. I just, I take the uh, mason jar and I exactly. screw the lid down loosely so that it can bounce. I have actually mason jar fermentation locks. I just wouldn't use it for that. And usually by 12 hours to 24 hours later, I have sour cream. I've had one fail one time. I have no idea what I did wrong. And how but does it stack, stock up the taste and texture? It tastes it. like sour cream. Okay. And then you can just keep rolling that through. The okay. thing is, the higher fat, the better the sour cream tastes. What about buttermilk? Have you done that? Buttermilk I have not made. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Buttermilk is cultured, though, isn't it? I don't know. I just, I know it's, just a, it's just a mesophila yeah, culture, right? You can make it fresh by taking... Um, yeah. That just means you haven't you haven't added the rennet or the rennet wherever that went the rennet right and you just culture it it's like yogurt it's the same way you culture it okay. keep it at a warm enough temperature for that to solidify by being cultured and then done are there so. certain cheeses you wouldn't want to make with non uh, cow's milk or does it is it does, is it all work so ready? different milks have different fat contents. And a goat's milk is gonna have less less, less curd coming out of it because of the, the, the lower fat. So different cheeses you may wanna do with, like, like a cheddar you usually do with a cow's milk. I do it with goat's milk all the time though. I just don't get as much yield from the milk per gallon of milk, yeah. So yes, different cheeses officially have different kinds of milk you're supposed to use. In fact, feta, you're supposed to use sheep's milk. But you can get sheep lipase for the flavoring, and then and then if you don't want, if you want like a a less flavorful feta cheese, if that strong flavor really bugs you, Nick, you can do it by not adding the lipase, and you might end up liking it. Since so it's a more mild European style feta, does not have the lipase in it. So the lipase is what's adding that that little bite, just like you know, like aging your cheddar for longer makes it sharper. Yeah. But the cheddar, the cheddar I did for Christmas a year ago, I aged it for only three months and it was fantastic. Just with that, you're just flipping it once a week so that the fats don't all end up on one side. It's pretty good. So you want it cool enough that it's not going to go bad. So like 60, 50 to 60 degrees if you can maintain that environment, which most of us don't have a cave. But a cave is a great way to keep that steady, steady temperature. And then the humidity, if it's too high, is bad. If it's too low, it'll dry out, even with that wax coating on it. So I don't know what the percentage is exactly for humidity. The way I age cheddar is I'll like put it in the fridge and I'll take it out for a bit. Like I'll, I'll move it around because I don't have a good aging solution. What you want is a mouse-free environment, which is cave-like, and my cave-like environment is not mouse-free. I haven't built the cheese rack. It needs to be like the cheese vault that has holes so the air can get in. But ideally, I mean, you would age it in a cave-like temperature, which is 50, I think it's what, 55 degrees. Which if you can dig, yeah. You can make your own. They make, like, the wine fridges. You can turn the temperature up on those. A lot of people use those for aging. I don't have a wine fridge. So, I have a fridge fridge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How close to 10 minutes are we? He's not going to answer. Two minutes. Any other questions? You guys going to go home and make cheese? Yes. Okay, we're going to do this early because why not? Because then you can get a nice break. Um, usually what I do is I have a wet cloth. 
Luckily, I have this little cup of water here. Yeah. Especially if your noodle strainer is not the shape of Jack Spearco's noodle strainer, which has high sides, which is brilliant for cheese. If it's one of those, you know what I'm talking about? It's really easy for this cloth to fall down and like slide out the side if it's not sticking to it. So you wet it. It also helps the, the liquid go through. Line it, and then we're gonna pour that into there. This could be terrifically messy. Yeah. So we're also moving our cheese book. Okay. Ooh, oh, ah. don't wanna ruin that. So if you look at it now, and it, do, do you guys wanna see this before I, anybody who's interested in cheese, you can see how it looks a little bit differently. You can see the yellow, how that whey has just come out of there. It's a little, this is still a little less solid than I usually wait, but you just pour it through. <laughs> Wow, that's really messy. Yeah, right. <laughs> There's no good way to do this. It's like, what was that comedian that always smashed the watermelons? Gallagher. It's my Gallagher moment. So this is not going to let me pour all of it in here, so I'm going to let it strain. Um, so this is just, it's just coming out the bottom. I usually have a pot that holds it up a little bit. So we'll do that. I have a second cloth. And that's that's it. You'll just the curd's not holding together terribly well right now right now because I didn't let it go long enough. But yeah. So I'll hang this when it has a minute to strain a little bit more. Anyway, that's it. Our next session is in about what time is it? Yeah, jazz hands. Our next session is gonna be a really fun one from Hagai about making a solar pumping system. It starts at three o'clock, so until then, enjoy Hogeye, yourself. Are you gonna be doing it in here or are you? No. We're gonna be